So random digit dialing or RDD is um, the method that has been used to get random samples for decades. Um, and it's produced some very reliable results over the years and we think we understand it fairly well. However, there have been some technological changes and some cultural changes that have really created a crisis in random digit dialing. And so I'd like to kind of talk about um, that crisis uh, and some of the strategies that have been employed to try to adjust for that or fix that. Um, and then maybe talk about sort of where this might go in the future. So um, there is sort of a life cycle oftentimes for, for different polling methodologies based on culture, um, based on methodology and research and what we know about about sampling um, and about the technology that's available. And I think you can make a case that random digit dialing is nearing the end of its life, life cycle, um, which is somewhat surprising because cell phones have become so much more ubiquitous. Um, but from the 1950s onward, that has been the primary tool. Um, we may have to find ourselves back in the sort of messy sampling world of the 1920s through the 1940s, where we were using less than ideal sampling methods to try to um, triangulate and, and figure out what, what patterns were out there. Um, I've talked a little bit about the, the Dewey defeats Truman um, sort of kerfuffle um, and that's the kind of situation that results when we don't have a, a functional method to draw a random sample. Um, so we've seen this decline of, of um, maybe effectiveness or, or efficiency, or at least some, some potential problems that come with random digit dialing. But what I would note is that every single different pollster recognizes that there are challenges with, with this method and, and how it's working and have become increasingly sophisticated in trying to wring as much reliable information out of the the process that they have as is possible. And so different polling firms will do this differently. Um, and you'll see what's sometimes called a house effect um, with polling firms where um, one particular polling firm might skew a little bit older in their demographics. One particular polling firm might skew a little bit younger. Um, and it's based on different decision-making, uh, you know, or different decisions that are being made about how to navigate a world where just randomly calling up um, strings of numbers that look like phone numbers don't work quite as well as they did in the 50s and 60s. Um, and then while I would say that this has created a lot of murkiness and it's turned public opinion polling into as much an art as a science, I think on average, um, and what I mean by on average is if we consider the different house effects of different polling outfits, um, they tend to average out in a way that seems to give us a pretty good picture of what's happening in the larger world. That if we just simply look at one polling firm, we may be stuck with the bias that comes with their house effect. But if we aggregate polls, um, we can get a sense of maybe an underlying pattern that's not contingent on some of these subjective decisions that, that are, are occurring. Uh, all right, so I wanna talk about one strategy that's become increasingly common um, for fixing um, some of the problems that come with, with random digit dialing. Um, and that is that some demographics are less likely to answer their phone than others. Older people tend to be more likely to answer their phone than younger people. Um, certainly when I was a child, um, when the phone rang, we, we ran to the phone. It was like an exciting thing to find out who was calling you. Um, as cell phones became more prevalent, uh, the sense of a phone being sort of an invasive thing sort of came with that. And there became sort of a culture of, I'm going to consciously not check my phone. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to give my attention to the person I, I'm with. Uh, and then with um, the ability to sort of link numbers to names very easily with caller ID, uh, it became easier for people to make the decision to screen phone calls and not pick up numbers that they didn't recognize. So pollsters have, have found this problem where um, younger people are less likely to respond to surveys. Um, also folks who have less education are less likely to respond to surveys. Uh, how do we sort of fix that? Well, the solution is waiting um, in which we take census data typically uh, where there are a variety of pieces of information about the larger population that we have with, with pretty good precision, right? So the distribution of gender, um, distribution of age, racial categories, um, education categories tend to be pretty well um, measured by census data. And so we can compare our sample against that. And we can say, oh, it turns out that men are 50% of the US population, but um, they're only 
42% of my sample. I, I've undersampled men um, it, it, through this process. And a process of weighting sort of mathematically adjusts the, let's say the value, um, the weight, the count, um, how much emphasis we place on each man in the sample um, to sort of bring the overall pattern sort of into alignment as if we had actually sampled 50% men and 50% women. So it corrects for those demographic imbalances and can give us results that mathematically um, look like they should represent the larger population as it exists. Now this creates two problems. Um, one is that we have to figure out what factors we need to wait for. Like what are the salient factors that we need to map into the population or map against the population to be able to get results that, that, will work, that work, that work, that look correct? Um, and that's an open question. Um, prior to the 2016 election, um, a lot of polling firms uh, waited based on gender and age, but didn't always wait on education. After the 2016 election, there was some sort of post polling analysis that said that um, folks who had maybe a high school degree or less were less likely to answer polls and therefore were undercounted in the public opinion polling data that was happening and that needed to be adjusted. And so most polling firms, I think now, add in a, a measure for weighting population. But there's another sort of deeper, maybe philosophical question that comes with that, which is, you know, I have people in these demographic categories who answer the phone and I'm using those people as a proxy to understand the opinions and attitudes, beliefs and behaviors of people who choose not to answer the phone. And if that decision to answer the phone is, is literally just a decision you know, that's, made, that's made randomly, Right. I called this person and they happened to be having a conversation and didn't answer. I called this person and they had just finished their conversation and so they picked up the phone. If it's that random, that's fine. But I suspect there's something else going on that folks who answer unknown numbers and agree to take surveys are aberrant. Um, I love surveys. I, I always um, try to take surveys back when um, household um, landline surveys were, were very common. Um, the polling firms would always ask, you know, to talk to the person whose birthday was closest to the, the current date so that they didn't always get the like person who answered the phone. They would also get, you know, other people in the household. Um, I always lied and said that I was, I was, that was me, uh, because I like taking polls and surveys, uh, but that's unusual. Um, I would suggest to you that it's also correlated with, um, with trust, uh, whether or not you answer an unknown number and whether you agree to complete a survey. And trust is associated with a whole range of other social science or social phenomena. And so if the people you are polling are high on trust and the people you're not getting are low on trust, you're gonna have a really hard time in a social science sense of saying something accurate about the people you didn't get on the phone using the people you did as a proxy. We don't really have a solution for that. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting sort of philosophical puzzle about how we, how we solve for that. Um, but waiting isn't, isn't, isn't the fix that we would want it to be. Um, another problem that we've run into with, uh, random digit dialing is just plunging response rates. Like I said, you know, 30 years ago, it was very common for people to just like rush to answer the phone. And now it's very common for people to screen numbers and not answer the phone, let it go to voicemail. Uh, and that's resulted in response rates just collapsing. So it used to be that 50% was a pretty standard response rate. Um, you, you could get that fairly easily without a whole lot of effort. Um, now, uh, the best pollsters, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Nielsen because they do really an amazing job, um, struggle. They struggle to get 25%. And so uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was called up um, to complete a, a television viewing survey for Nielsen. Um, and you know, Nielsen has amazing name recognition. Anybody who watches TV has probably heard about the Nielsen ratings. Um, so I knew what, the, knew what it was about. I knew they were a legitimate organization. I knew when they offered me um, 50 bucks to do this survey, I was like, oh, that's, I'm going to get money from this. They're, they're gonna pay. Um, Nielsen's a reputable organization. So I agreed to do the survey. They sent me a packet of information. 
They called me the day the packet of information arrived to make sure that I received it, and I understood how to fill it out. Um, and I just had to fill it out for a week. And halfway through the week, they called me a third time. I don't know how many times I missed their phone calls, how many times they tried, but they got me a third time and said, okay, you know, are you filling it out? Have you done this? And then when it was done, they called me a fourth time to say, all right, are you gonna put it in the mail tomorrow? And I, at that point I said, you know, this is, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. You must have the most fantastic response rate. And the person on the line said, uh, well, of the people we contact initially and offer cash to, to complete our survey, only half agree to do that. And of that half, only half ever actually send in their survey. And so even with all of that effort, and I realize Nielsen's doing, you know, filling out these forms is a little bit more labor intensive than just a 20 minute telephone survey. But even with all of that effort, Nielsen can only get to about 25%. Pew, which also does, you know, very rigorous um, systematic polling where they, they will, um, if they get a, a good number, right, not a, a dead number or a, a disconnected number, they get a good number, they call that number back multiple times until they get the person on the other end to, to sample so that they kind of push their way through that sort of bias of, of trust or of screening questions to get a representative sample. But even they're only able to get to about 10% um, of, of valid phone numbers that they're calling actually responding. And so it's... Um, for some polling firms just cataclysmically tiny, the percentage of people who actually are responding to polls. Um, that's really problematic um, because that issue I described earlier about waiting of do the people we have in our sample tell us anything about the people we don't becomes a, a much bigger problem than it would have been if our response rates were, were far higher. Um, so I want to talk briefly about um, sort of strategies that are, are being done to try to correct or adjust or fix um, some of these issues. So as I mentioned, I think at one point, um, even though federal law prohibits um, using computers to dial cell phones, um, polling firms for the last decade and a half have recognized that they, they have to, to call cell phones. And if that means punching numbers in manually, they will do that. Um, and so that potential source of bias um, of who has a cell phone versus who has a landline versus who has both um, has, I think, been corrected for. And you can you can wait to adjust further for people who have both landlines and cell phones who might be twice as likely to be called. Um, increasingly, pollsters are supplementing their telephone surveys with surveys conducted over the internet. Um, sometimes um, survey companies will contract with, with research firms that have a pool of people who've agreed to take surveys for money um, and they can kind of screen that pool and manage that pool and make sure that pool is demographically diverse and, and looks like the larger population or even looks at like a target population that you're interested in. Um, so trying to get creative with these are our sort of professional poll takers versus just random people. Um, it's hard to know how good these other methods are, but they certainly can provide a validity check if all of these measures are sort of pointing us in the same direction, we can more confidently say, I think I'm tapping into something, something. Um, whereas if they're telling us completely different stories, we have to scratch our head and trying to figure out what that story actually is. And so as a result, again, polling has become as much an art form as a science with different polling firms sort of developing their own style and way of doing things. Um, and yet poll aggregation seems to work pretty well that we, when we average out all of those um, those house effects, it seems to work pretty well. Um, we can also supplement public opinion polling with statistical modeling to try to explain behavior of people based not just on um, you know, what they say when we call them up, but also sort of linking that up with information about weather patterns, right? If we're trying to, to understand um, likely voters, right? So whether or not the weather is gonna be cold in your area versus warm in your area, and whether or not that might depress turnout and change patterns. We can build that in in a statistical sense. And in fact, political campaigns have actually gone the extra mile um, in that, um, in linking um, public opinion polling data that they do with um, national databases um, that parties assemble on people who have voted in the past or who have voted for them. Um, and that can then be linked to um, your browsing history, um, your Facebook, you know, likes your um, 
credit card statements and all sorts of different sources of data can get pulled in to build very sophisticated statistical models about your political behavior to try to supplement what we can get with public opinion polling data um, through these other techniques as well. So while we're in sort of a, a murky, messy um, environment, um, it's one in which there's incredible innovation and adaptation occurring to try to continue to get results that are, are helpful and help us to kind of have a sense of, of social patterns as they're unfolding folding in our society.